The ionosphere is the ionized part of Earth's upper atmosphere, from about 60 km miles to 1,000 km miles altitude, a region that includes the thermosphere and parts of the mesosphere and exosphere. The ionosphere is ionized by solar radiation. It plays an important role in atmospheric electricity and forms the inner edge of the magnetosphere. It has practical importance because, among other functions, it influences radio propagation to distant places on the Earth. Topic. History As early as 1839, the German mathematician and physicist Carl Friedrich Gauss postulated that an electrically conducting region of the atmosphere could account for observed variations of Earth's magnetic field. Sixty years later, Guglielmo Marconi received the first trans-Atlantic radio signal on December 12, 1901, in St. John's, Newfoundland now in Canada using a 152.4 metres 500 feet, kite-supported antenna for reception. The transmitting station in Poldu, Cornwall, used a spark gap transmitter to produce a signal with a frequency of approximately 500 kHz and a power of 100 times more than any radio signal previously produced. The message received was three dits, the Morse code for the letter S to reach Newfoundland the signal would have to bounce off the ionosphere twice. Dr. Jack Belrose has contested this, however, based on theoretical and experimental work. However, Marconi did achieve transatlantic wireless communications in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. One year later, in 1902, Oliver Heaviside proposed the existence of the Kennelly Heaviside layer of the ionosphere which bears his name. Heaviside's proposal included means by which radio signals are transmitted around the Earth's curvature. Heaviside's proposal, coupled with Planck's law of black body radiation, may have hampered the growth of radio astronomy for the detection of electromagnetic waves from celestial bodies until 1932 and the development of high frequency radio transceivers. Also in 1902, Arthur Edwin Kennelly discovered some of the ionosphere's radio electrical properties. In 1912, the U.S. Congress imposed the Radio Act of 1912 on amateur radio operators, limiting their operations to frequencies above 1.5 MHz wavelength 200 meters or smaller. The government thought those frequencies were useless. This led to the discovery of HF radio propagation via the ionosphere in 1923. In 1926, Scottish physicist Robert Watson Watt introduced the term ionosphere in a letter published only in 1969 in Nature. We have in quite recent years seen the universal adoption of the term stratosphere, dot and, dot the companion term troposphere. The term ionosphere, for the region in which the main characteristic is large-scale ionization with considerable mean free paths, appears appropriate as an addition to this series. In the early 1930s, test transmissions of Radio Luxembourg inadvertently provided evidence of the first radio modification of the ionosphere. HARP ran a series of experiments in 2017 using the eponymous Luxembourg effect. Edward V. Appleton was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1947 for his confirmation in 1927 of the existence of the ionosphere. Lloyd Berkner first measured the height and density of the ionosphere. This permitted the first complete theory of short-wave radio propagation. Maurice V. Wilkes and J. A. Ratcliffe researched the topic of radio propagation of very long radio waves in the ionosphere. Vitaly Ginzburg has developed a theory of electromagnetic wave propagation in plasmas such as the ionosphere. In 1962, the Canadian satellite Alouette 1 was launched to study the ionosphere. Following its success were Alouette 2 in 1965 and the two ISIS satellites in 1969 and 1971, further Arrows A and B in 1972 and 1975, all for measuring the ionosphere. On July 26, 1963 the first operational geosynchronous satellite Syncom 2 was launched. The board radio beacons on this satellite and its successors enabled, for the first time, the measurement of total electron content, tech variation along a radio beam from geostationary orbit to an Earth receiver. The rotation of the plane of polarization directly measures tech along the path. Australian geophysicist Elizabeth Essex Cohen from 1969 onwards was using this technique to monitor the atmosphere above Australia and Antarctica.
Topic: Geophysics. The ionosphere is a shell of electrons and electrically charged atoms and molecules that surrounds the Earth, stretching from a height of about 50 kilometers (31 miles) to more than 1,000 kilometers (620 miles). It exists primarily due to ultraviolet radiation from the Sun. The lowest part of the Earth's atmosphere, the troposphere extends from the surface to about 10 kilometers 6.2 miles. Above that is the stratosphere, followed by the mesosphere. In the stratosphere incoming solar radiation creates the ozone layer. At heights of above 80 kilometers 50 miles, in the thermosphere, the atmosphere is so thin that free electrons can exist for short periods of time before they are captured by a nearby positive ion. The number of these free electrons is sufficient to affect radio propagation. This portion of the atmosphere is partially ionized and contains a plasma which is referred to as the ionosphere. Ultraviolet UV, X-ray and shorter wavelengths of solar radiation are ionizing, since photons at these frequencies contain sufficient energy to dislodge an electron from a neutral gas atom or molecule upon absorption. In this process the light electron obtains a high velocity so that the temperature of the created electronic gas is much higher of the order of 1000 K than the one of ions and neutrals. The reverse process to ionization is recombination, in which a free electron is captured by a positive ion. Recombination occurs spontaneously, and causes the emission of a photon carrying away the energy produced upon recombination. As gas density increases at lower altitudes, the recombination process prevails, since the gas molecules and ions are closer together. The balance between these two processes determines the quantity of ionization present. Ionization depends primarily on the sun and its activity. The amount of ionization in the ionosphere varies greatly with the amount of radiation received from the sun. Thus there is a diurnal time of day effect and a seasonal effect. The local winter hemisphere is tipped away from the sun, thus there is less received solar radiation. The activity of the sun is associated with the sunspot cycle, with more radiation occurring with more sunspots. Radiation received also varies with geographical location, polar, auroral zones, mid-latitudes, and equatorial regions. There are also mechanisms that disturb the ionosphere and decrease the ionization. There are disturbances such as solar flares and the associated release of charged particles into the solar wind which reaches the Earth and interacts with its geomagnetic field. The ionospheric layers At night the F layer is the only layer of significant ionization present, while the ionization in the E and D layers is extremely low. During the day, the D and E layers become much more heavily ionized, as does the F layer, which develops an additional, weaker region of ionization known as the F1 layer. The F2 layer persists by day and night and is the main region responsible for the refraction and reflection of radio waves. Topic D layer The D layer is the innermost layer, 60 km 37 miles to 90 km 56 miles above the surface of the Earth. Ionization here is due to Lyman series alpha hydrogen radiation at a wavelength of 121.6 nm nm ionizing nitric oxide no. In addition, high solar activity can generate hard X-rays wavelength medium frequency MF and lower high frequency HF radio waves are significantly attenuated within the D layer, as the passing radio waves cause electrons to move, which then collide with the neutral molecules, giving up their energy. Lower frequencies experience greater absorption because they move the electrons farther, leading to greater chance of collisions. This is the main reason for absorption of HF radio waves, particularly at 10 MHz and below, with progressively less absorption at higher frequencies. This effect peaks around noon and is reduced at night due to a decrease in the D layer's thickness, only a small part remains due to cosmic rays. A common example of the D layer in action is the disappearance of distant AM broadcast band stations in the daytime. During solar proton events, ionization can reach unusually high levels in the D region over high and polar latitudes. 
Such very rare events are known as polar cap absorption or PCA events, because the increased ionization significantly enhances the absorption of radio signals passing through the region. In fact, absorption levels can increase by many tens of dB during intense events, which is enough to absorb most if not all, transpolar HF radio signal transmissions. Such events typically last less than 24 to 48 hours. E-layer The E-layer is the middle layer, 90 km 56 miles to 150 km 93 miles above the surface of the Earth. Ionization is due to soft X-ray and far ultraviolet UV solar radiation ionization of molecular oxygen O2. Normally, at oblique incidence, this layer can only reflect radio waves having frequencies lower than about 10 MHz and may contribute a bit to absorption on frequencies above. However, during intense sporadic E events, the S layer can reflect frequencies up to 50 MHz and higher. The vertical structure of the E layer is primarily determined by the competing effects of ionization and recombination. At night the E layer weakens because the primary source of ionization is no longer present. After sunset an increase in the height of the E layer maximum increases the range to which radio waves can travel by reflection from the layer. This region is also known as the Kennelly heaviside layer or simply the heaviside layer. Its existence was predicted in 1902 independently and almost simultaneously by the American electrical engineer Arthur Edwin Kennelly (1861–1939) and the British physicist Oliver Heaviside (1850–1925). However, it was not until 1924 that its existence was detected by Edward V. Appleton and Miles Barnett. Topic S. The S layer, sporadic E layer is characterized by small, thin clouds of intense ionization, which can support reflection of radio waves, rarely up to 225 MHz. Sporadic E events may last for just a few minutes to several hours. Sporadic E propagation makes VHF operating radio amateurs very excited, as propagation paths that are generally unreachable can open up. There are multiple causes of sporadic E that are still being pursued by researchers. This propagation occurs most frequently during the summer months when high signal levels may be reached. The skip distances are generally around 1,640 km 1,020 miles. Distances for one-hop propagation can be anywhere from 900 km 560 miles to 2,500 km 1,600 miles. Double hop reception over 3,500 kilometers (2,200 miles) is possible. Topic F layer. The F layer or region, also known as the Appleton-Barnett layer, extends from about 150 kilometers (93 miles) to more than 500 kilometers (310 miles) above the surface of Earth. It is the layer with the highest electron density, which implies signals penetrating this layer will escape into space. Electron production is dominated by extreme ultraviolet UV, 10 to 100 nanometers, radiation ionizing atomic oxygen. The F layer consists of one layer F2 at night, but during the day, a secondary peak labeled F1 often forms in the electron density profile. Because the F2 layer remains by day and night, it is responsible for most skywave propagation of radio waves and long distances high frequency HF, or shortwave radio communications. Above the F layer, the number of oxygen ions decreases and lighter ions such as hydrogen and helium become dominant. This region above the F layer peak and below the plasmasphere is called the topside ionosphere. From 1972 to 1975 NASA launched the EROS and EROS B satellites to study the F region. Topic: Ionospheric model. An ionospheric model is a mathematical description of the ionosphere as a function of location, altitude, day of year, phase of the sunspot cycle and geomagnetic activity. 
Geophysically, the state of the ionospheric plasma may be described by four parameters, electron density, electron and ion temperature and, since several species of ions are present, ionic composition. Radio propagation depends uniquely on electron density. Models are usually expressed as computer programs. The model may be based on basic physics of the interactions of the ions and electrons with the neutral atmosphere and sunlight, or it may be a statistical description based on a large number of observations or a combination of physics and observations. One of the most widely used models is the International Reference Ionosphere IRI, which is based on data and specifies the four parameters just mentioned. The IRI is an international project sponsored by the Committee on Space Research COSPAR, and the International Union of Radio Science URSI. The major data sources are the worldwide network of ionosons, the powerful and coherent scatter radars Hickamarca, Arecibo, Millstone Hill, Malvern, St. Santin, the Isis and Alouette topside sounders, and in situ instruments on several satellites and rockets. IRI is updated yearly. IRI is more accurate in describing the variation of the electron density from bottom of the ionosphere to the altitude of maximum density than in describing the total electron content tech. Since 1999 this model is international standard for the terrestrial ionosphere standard TS-16457. Topic. Persistent anomalies to the idealized model Ionograms allow deducing, via computation, the true shape of the different layers. Nonhomogeneous structure of the electron-ion plasma produces rough echo traces, seen predominantly at night and at higher latitudes, and during disturbed conditions. Topic. Winter anomaly. At mid-latitudes, the F2 layer daytime ion production is higher in the summer, as expected, since the sun shines more directly on the Earth. However, there are seasonal changes in the molecular to atomic ratio of the neutral atmosphere that cause the summer ion loss rate to be even higher. The result is that the increase in the summertime loss overwhelms the increase in summertime production, and total F2 ionization is actually lower in the local summer months. This effect is known as the winter anomaly. The anomaly is always present in the northern hemisphere, but is usually absent in the southern hemisphere during periods of low solar activity. Topic. Equatorial anomaly Within approximately plus or minus 20 degrees of the magnetic equator, is the equatorial anomaly. It is the occurrence of a trough in the ionization in the F2 layer at the equator and crests at about 17 degrees in magnetic latitude. The Earth's magnetic field lines are horizontal at the magnetic equator. Solar heating and tidal oscillations in the lower ionosphere move plasma up and across the magnetic field lines. This sets up a sheet of electric current in the E region which, with the horizontal magnetic field, forces ionization up into the F layer, concentrating at plus or minus 20 degrees from the magnetic equator. This phenomenon is known as the equatorial fountain. Topic. Equatorial electrojet The worldwide solar-driven wind results in the so-called SQ solar quiet current system in the E region of the Earth's ionosphere ionospheric dynamo region 100 to 130 kilometers 62 to 81 miles altitude. Resulting from this current is an electrostatic field directed west-east dawn dusk in the equatorial day side of the ionosphere. At the magnetic dip equator, where the geomagnetic field is horizontal, this electric field results in an enhanced eastward current flow within plus or minus 3 degrees of the magnetic equator, known as the equatorial electrojet. Topic. Ephemeral ionospheric perturbations Topic. X-rays, Sudden Ionospheric Disturbances CID. 
When the Sun is active, strong solar flares can occur that hit the sunlit side of Earth with hard X-rays. The X-rays penetrate to the D region, releasing electrons that rapidly increase absorption, causing a high-frequency radio blackout. During this time very low-frequency signals will be reflected by the D layer instead of the E layer, where the increased atmospheric density will usually increase the absorption of the wave and thus dampen it. As soon as the X-rays end, the sudden ionospheric disturbance SID, or radio blackout ends as the electrons in the D region recombine rapidly and signal strengths return to normal. Topic. Protons, polar cap absorption PCA. Associated with solar flares is a release of high-energy protons. These particles can hit the Earth within 15 minutes to 2 hours of the solar flare. The protons spiral around and down the magnetic field lines of the Earth and penetrate into the atmosphere near the magnetic poles increasing the ionization of the D and E layers. PCAs typically last anywhere from about an hour to several days, with an average of around 24 to 36 hours. Coronal mass ejections can also release energetic protons that enhance D region absorption in the polar regions. Topic: Geomagnetic storms. A geomagnetic storm is a temporary intense disturbance of the Earth's magnetosphere. During a geomagnetic storm, the F layer will become unstable, fragment, and may even disappear completely. In the northern and southern pole regions of the Earth aurorae will be observable in the sky. Topic. Lightning Lightning can cause ionospheric perturbations in the D region in one of two ways. The first is through VLF very low frequency radio waves launched into the magnetosphere. These so-called whistler Mode waves can interact with radiation belt particles and cause them to precipitate onto the ionosphere, adding ionization to the D region. These disturbances are called lightning-induced electron precipitation LEP, events. Additional ionization can also occur from direct heating, ionization as a result of huge motions of charge in lightning strikes. These events are called early, fast. In 1925, C.T.R. Wilson proposed a mechanism by which electrical discharge from lightning storms could propagate upwards from clouds to the ionosphere. Around the same time, Robert Watson Watt, working at the radio research station in SLU, UK, suggested that the ionospheric sporadic E layer S appeared to be enhanced as a result of lightning but that more work was needed. In 2005, C. Davis and C. Johnson, working at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire, UK, demonstrated that the S layer was indeed enhanced as a result of lightning activity. Their subsequent research has focused on the mechanism by which this process can occur. Topic. Applications Topic. Radio communication Due to the ability of ionized atmospheric gases to refract high-frequency or shortwave radio waves, the ionosphere can reflect radio waves directed into the sky back toward the Earth. Radio waves directed at an angle into the sky can return to Earth beyond the horizon. This technique, called skip or skywave, Propagation, has been used since the 1920s to communicate at international or intercontinental distances. The returning radio waves can reflect off the Earth's surface into the sky again, allowing greater ranges to be achieved with multiple hops. This communication method is variable and unreliable, with reception over a given path depending on time of day or night, the seasons, weather, and the 11-year sunspot cycle. During the first half of the 20th century it was widely used for transoceanic telephone and telegraph service, and business and diplomatic communication. Due to its relative unreliability, shortwave radio communication has been mostly abandoned by the telecommunications industry, though it remains important for high-latitude communication where satellite-based radio communication is not possible. 
Some broadcasting stations and automated services still use shortwave radio frequencies, as do radio amateur hobbyists for private recreational contacts. Topic. Mechanism of refraction When a radio wave reaches the ionosphere, the electric field in the wave forces the electrons in the ionosphere into oscillation at the same frequency as the radio wave. Some of the radio frequency energy is given up to this resonant oscillation. The oscillating electrons will then either be lost to recombination or will re-radiate the original wave energy. Total refraction can occur when the collision frequency of the ionosphere is less than the radio frequency, and if the electron density in the ionosphere is great enough. A qualitative understanding of how an electromagnetic wave propagates through the ionosphere can be obtained by recalling geometric optics. Since the ionosphere is a plasma, it can be shown that the refractive index is less than unity. Hence, the electromagnetic ray is bent away from the normal rather than toward the normal as would be indicated when the refractive index is greater than unity. It can also be shown that the refractive index of a plasma, and hence the ionosphere, is frequency dependent. See dispersion optics. The critical frequency is the limiting frequency at or below which a radio wave is reflected by an ionospheric layer at vertical incidence. If the transmitted frequency is higher than the plasma frequency of the ionosphere, then the electrons cannot respond fast enough, and they are not able to re-radiate the signal. It is calculated as shown below. F critical equals 9 times n display style F underscore text critical equals 9 times sqrt n where n equals electron density per cubic meter and f critical as in hz. The maximum usable frequency MUF is defined as the upper frequency limit that can be used for transmission between two points at a specified time. f MUF equals f critical sin alpha Display style F underscore text MUF equals FRAC F underscore text critical sin alpha where alpha display style alpha equals angle of attack, the angle of the wave relative to the horizon, and sin is the sine function. The cutoff frequency is the frequency below which a radio wave fails to penetrate a layer of the ionosphere at the incidence angle required for transmission between two specified points by refraction from the layer. Topic. Other applications The open system electrodynamic tether, which uses the ionosphere, is being researched. The space tether uses plasma contactors and the ionosphere as parts of a circuit to extract energy from the Earth's magnetic field by electromagnetic induction. Topic: Measurements. Topic: Overview. Scientists explore the structure of the ionosphere by a wide variety of methods. They include Passive observations of optical and radio emissions generated in the ionosphere Bouncing radio waves of different frequencies from it Incoherent scatter radars such as the EISCAT, Sondra Stromfjord, Millstone Hill, Arecibo, Advanced Modular and Coherent Scatter Radar AMISR, and Hikamarka radars Coherent scatter radars such as the Super Dual Auroral Radar Network Superdern radars Special receivers to detect how the reflected waves have changed from the transmitted waves, a variety of experiments, such as HARP High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, involve high-power radio transmitters to modify the properties of the ionosphere. These investigations focus on studying the properties and behavior of ionospheric plasma, with particular emphasis on being able to understand and use it to enhance communications and surveillance systems for both civilian and military purposes. HARP was started in 1993 as a proposed 20-year experiment, and is currently active near Gakona, Alaska. 
The Superdern radar project researches the high and mid latitudes using coherent backscatter of radio waves in the 8 to 20 MHz range. Coherent backscatter is similar to Bragg scattering in crystals and involves the constructive interference of scattering from ionospheric density irregularities. The project involves more than 11 different countries and multiple radars in both hemispheres. Scientists are also examining the ionosphere by the changes to radio waves, from satellites and stars, passing through it. The Arecibo Radio Telescope located in Puerto Rico, was originally intended to study Earth's ionosphere. Topic. Ionograms Ionograms show the virtual heights and critical frequencies of the ionospheric layers and which are measured by an ionosonde. An ionosonde sweeps a range of frequencies, usually from 0.1 to 30 MHz, transmitting at vertical incidence to the ionosphere. As the frequency increases, each wave is refracted less by the ionization in the layer, and so each penetrates further before it is reflected. Eventually, a frequency is reached that enables the wave to penetrate the layer without being reflected. For ordinary mode waves, this occurs when the transmitted frequency just exceeds the peak plasma, or critical, frequency of the layer. Tracings of the reflected high-frequency radio pulses are known as ionograms. Reduction rules are given in URSI Handbook of Ionogram Interpretation and Reduction. Edited by William Roy Piggott and Carl Rahr, Elsevier Amsterdam, 1961 Translations into Chinese, French, Japanese and Russian are available. Incoherent scatter radars Incoherent scatter radars operate above the critical frequencies. Therefore, the technique allows probing the ionosphere, unlike ionosons, also above the electron density peaks. The thermal fluctuations of the electron density scattering the transmitted signals lack coherence, which gave the technique its name. Their power spectrum contains information not only on the density, but also on the ion and electron temperatures, ion masses and drift velocities. Topic. GNSS radio occultation Radio occultation is a remote sensing technique where a GNSS signal tangentially scrapes the Earth, passing through the atmosphere, and is received by a low Earth orbit LEO satellite. As the signal passes through the atmosphere, it is refracted, curved and delayed. An LEO satellite samples the total electron content and bending angle of many such signal paths as it watches the GNSS satellite rise or set behind the Earth. Using an inverse Abel's transform, a radial profile of refractivity at that tangent point on Earth can be reconstructed. Major GNSS radio occultation missions include the GRACE, CHAMP, and COSMIC. Topic. Indices of the ionosphere In empirical models of the ionosphere such as Neckwick, the following indices are used as indirect indicators of the state of the ionosphere. Topic. Solar intensity F10.7 and R12 are two indices commonly used in ionospheric modeling. Both are valuable for their long historical records covering multiple solar cycles. F10.7 is a measurement of the intensity of solar radio emissions at a frequency of 2,800 MHz made using a ground radio telescope. R12 is a 12 months average of daily sunspot numbers. Both indices have been shown to be correlated to each other. However, both indices are only indirect indicators of solar ultraviolet and X-ray emissions, which are primarily responsible for causing ionization in the Earth's upper atmosphere. We now have data from the GOES spacecraft that measures the background X-ray flux from the Sun, a parameter more closely related to the ionization levels in the ionosphere. Topic. Geomagnetic disturbances. The A and K indices are a measurement of the behavior of the horizontal component of the geomagnetic field. 
The K index uses a scale from 0 to 9 to measure the change in the horizontal component of the geomagnetic field. A new K index is determined at the Boulder Geomagnetic Observatory. The geomagnetic activity levels of the Earth are measured by the fluctuation of the Earth's magnetic field in SI units called Teslas or in non-SI Gauss, especially in older literature. The Earth's magnetic field is measured around the planet by many observatories. The data retrieved is processed and turned into measurement indices. Daily measurements for the entire planet are made available through an estimate of the AP index, called the Planetary A index pi. Topic. GPS, GNSS ionospheric correction There are a number of models used to understand the effects of the ionosphere global navigation satellite systems. The Klobuchar model is currently used to compensate for ionospheric effects in GPS. This model was developed at the U.S. Air Force Geophysical Research Laboratory circa 1974 by John Jack Klobuchar. The Galileo navigation system uses the Neckwick model. Topic. Ionospheres of other planets and natural satellites Objects in the solar system that have appreciable atmospheres i.e., all of the major planets and many of the larger natural satellites generally produce ionospheres. Planets known to have ionospheres include Venus, Uranus, Mars and Jupiter. The atmosphere of Titan includes an ionosphere that ranges from about 1100 kilometers, 680 miles to 1300 kilometers, 810 miles in altitude and contains carbon compounds. Topic: See also. equals <laughs> equals notes.